Welcome everybody. Hello. How are you all? Welcome to the uh, to uh, our second every six months uh, commencement of the uh, Urban Sustainability Program. Um, I often think about that, that I'm going to say some a few words to you that you know might be really pithy, but what I find is when I get up here, I have so many people to thank that it takes up my speaking time. So I'll try to say something pithy later and, and, and say a lot of thanks now. So there are a lot of, there's so many people to thank for this. And I, if I miss a name or two, please, you know, you can come hit me afterwards or something. But anyway, so I want to welcome all of you, our honored guests. Um, President Boggs, President of Antioch University, Los Angeles. Robert McKim, our, the President of our Board of Trustees of Antioch University, Los Angeles. Donald Wa DJ Waldy, our, our, uh, our honored and esteemed friend and guest uh, speaker and commencement address deliverer. Our graduating class, and uh, I'm, I assume you know some of their names, I will introduce them all a little bit later. And our faculty, uh, and I'll go from right to left, Gilda Haas, core faculty in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, in our program, Andrea Richards, core faculty in the BA program, and Dean of Academic Assessment and Student Learning. I think I got that right. Jane Paul, uh, teaching faculty in our program, and uh, Sue Gentile, who also teaches in our Antioch New England campus, so she crosses the country several times a year to teach with us, uh, who is adjunct, oh no, what are you? you? We have a different title now. Anyway, she's faculty in our program. <laughs> she is a master teacher. All these are master teachers, every one of them. So, um, I think we want to just get on, I, as I said, I have so many people to thank. So all of these people whose names I just mentioned um, were, have been responsible over the last, in some cases, as many as six years, I think, and more recently in the last two and a half for bringing this program to where it is today. Um, I won't go into all the details of what it takes to launch uh, and to, to create and launch a graduate program, but I will just tell you that it's an enormous amount of work that, you know, requires many, many people. And, and I have, have really been, I was originally tasked along with Andrea Richards for creating this program. Um, I was mm, loose-lipped enough, I guess, to open up my mouth and say, hey, you know, I think we should have a master's program in urban sustainability. And our president at the time jumped on it because he saw that this was a field that was, that there are not a lot of programs out there in the world, and this is a field that is becoming more and more current and more and more important each day. If you don't know what urban sustainability is, it, there are so many definitions that I, if I would be up here for the entire ceremony giving them to you, but I'd be happy to talk with any of you after the, after the ceremony about what my ideas are. And I'm sure our graduates will have, if they haven't already shared many of their ideas, we'll be sharing them with you uh, in the days to come. So, and uh, oh, also, our, Dr. Boggs, our president, came on as provost of the institution when, and was incredibly supportive of us, of us through the, uh, the accreditation process, which is uh, a, ro a rocky and rigorous road. And then I also want to thank all of those who are, are assisting us today, our, our work studies who have, have joined us in various capacities during the week. I don't know if you know, we're coming off a, a six-day residency that is a, a uh, it's a wild ride from Tuesday through Sunday, um, and but we're we're so filled with information. By the time we get home on Sunday night, we we need we need to go into hibernation for a few days. But uh, it's really been a, an extraordinary week that we've spent with our students. And then I also want to thank Sarah Brin, our program coordinator, who's hiding at the back of the room.
You know, everybody lifts a lot of weight in this program, but in the, in the, in the, pro, the uh, program coordinators, and particularly in this program, because this is not a job where, you know, uh, the coordinator is seeing to it that a record gets from one place to another. This is really uh, high level event production. We move all over the city. We're not just in classrooms. There are endless moving parts. There are many names to remember. And so the, uh, uh, a uh, program coordinator is a kind of an unsung role very often, and I intend to sing it at every commencement because I value Sarah's work so much in this program. So anyway, thank, thank you all very much. So now, Gilda Haas. Yes, Gilda Haas is going to very briefly introduce our speaker. Oh, I have? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I like surprise. Our speaker, um, DJ Daryl. No, oh. Our student speaker. I am going to briefly introduce our student speaker. And fortunately, the whole time that Donald was talking, I was in my head. I was going Belanzija, Belanzija, because I always get it mixed up. <laughs> I always say it wrong. Did I say it right? <laughs> Balan Balanzia. Balanzia. Uh, well, so, so, you know, sometimes it takes a little while to learn something, which is, I'm sure, the point of Daryl's speech. I'm very proud to introduce um, Daryl Balanzia, and uh, I'm his mentor. And um, he also mentors me. Um, that's the way these things go. And... Um, Apparently, he didn't do a really good job on the last name, though. Okay, come up here, Daryl. <laughs> Thank you, Gilda. That was, that was a nice introduction. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'd like to uh, start by thanking uh, my wife, first of all, for putting up with all the, the evenings when I couldn't put my own kids to bed and had to stay in front of a computer and on the weekends taking the kids so that I could still stay in front of the computer and, and type. And kids, thank you for putting up with all my quick to bedtime stories so I can get back and do my homework. Um, my mom for coming up, my in-laws David and Linda for making the drive up. Um, everyone here, thank you for inspiring me and, and uh, motivating me along the way. So I prepared a little speech for the occasion. Um, Hope you like it. Welcome, everyone. I'd like to start by expressing my gratitude, uh, not just to be selected to deliver this commencement speech, but also to be a welcome member of this community of urban sustainability warriors. I couldn't have asked for a more dedicated and inspired group of people to work with and learn from. As unpredictable and uncertain as the future of our planet may seem, I take immense comfort in the fact that people like you have decided that our collective future can't wait, that the time for action and compassion is now. And so here we are manifesting this future as we go and taking as many friends, family, and strangers as we can along for the ride. Of course, the path is, the path is long and riddled with traps and diversions, but I know that it bends towards a more peaceful, just, and sustainable world. I'm honored to walk this path with all of you. As a teacher, parent, and student, I feel especially connected to this future. And like many people, I remember feeling myself torn between feelings of hope and despair as I thought about the kind of world we are creating for our kids and for future generations. This feeling is exactly what brought me to study permaculture design eight years ago. And it's what brought me to this program two years ago. I didn't need any more evidence of environmental destruction, social injustice, or economic disparity. I couldn't stand any more hand-wringing, and I didn't want to be a part of the culture of cynicism and fear. We can't trust ourselves to make wise and beautiful decisions based on a fear of the future. On the contrary, we need to make our decisions out of a love and understanding of the moment so that when the future becomes this moment, we'll be embracing it, 
understanding our place in the world, and making the right decision, decisions for our future. But it's not simply a love of the moment that we need. It's also a theoretical and practical understanding of the systems we are truly up against, politically, socially, and ecologically. This willingness to embrace the facts as they are, and to take an honest account of one's own life and see to what extent we are also a part of the problem is perhaps the most important yet difficult part of the solution. Once we summon the courage to take this sort of personal inventory, the solutions are only limited by our ability to imagine them. And this is precisely the sort of moral accounting and creative problem solving that this urban sustainability program is all about. We can't solve the problems of the world until we orient ourselves within the problems in our communities and work to change the world from the inside out. As simple as it may sound, this pattern is the solution. Or, as we discuss in Gilda's class, the problem is the solution. And its ripples are now being felt throughout the world. So let's turn these ripples into waves, knowing we can trace their source back here to this program and the community it's created. A community is not just defined by the physical borders that people may live in. In a much broader sense, a community is a group of people united by a common vision and who share a common purpose. We are that community. And our purpose is simple, to care for each other and for the earth that we live on. And to anyone who denies or doubts that this kind of world is possible, let's remember the words of the great Shel Silverstein. Listen to the mustn'ts, child. Listen to the don'ts. Listen to the shouldn'ts, the impossibles, the won'ts. Listen to the never haves, then listen close to me. Anything can happen, child. Anything can be. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daryl, and thank you for exemplifying and thank you for representing your classmates who all of you have done really exemplary and extraordinary learning and demonstrated it last night in your, the presentation of your capstone projects. We're proud of, very proud of all of you and I think you've made a, a wonderful choice for somebody to speak for your class. So. Um, one of the pleasures that I take in this, in running this program is that I, there are some decisions that I, we collaborate on, on everything and then I get to make the decisions after hearing all the recommendations. So part of that is um, coming up with ideas for people who we want to address our students at various occasions um, and none possibly more important than at their, at their commencement. So I think probably each of you can identify any number of people who have inspired you to do the work that you're doing. I think some of you named them in, in, the, wor in the work you, did, you presented last night. I'm sure any of you out there in the audience can do the same. You can think of a mentor. You can think of somebody whose work out there in the world inspires you in some way and makes you want to aspire to do similar work. So I've collected any number of mentors in my life, and a lot of them are up on the stage right now. But one of the ones that I at first collected from a distance and then uh, brought closer and closer to me until I actually had him standing in front of me is DJ Waldy. DJ Waldy has among other things, lived in the city of Lakewood for his entire life, but more importantly, he's chronicled the life of that city in possibly the most poetic and lyrical way that one could chronicle the history of a small city in a county that has 88 cities. So, one of the things that we talk a lot about in this program is the idea of the importance of place. Daryl referred to it, 
that we have to we have to be in our communities. Those are our places. And those who don't know their the places they live in have have really been robbed of an of an opportunity of an understanding of something that makes that place a, a deeper and more valuable experience as you live in it. And I think we know that we, we, we take care of the things that we love. We care for our children. We keep our, in some cases, we keep our houses clean and we, we, we uh, grow, grow beautiful vegetables in our gardens. Um, and, and those are our places as well, but we really need to love our communities. So one of, the, one of the people who really has inspired me to understand the value of identifying with and learning as much about my place is D.J. Waldy. D.J. Waldy has written several books, Holy Land, the first among them, and the one that, the, the, the work that I'm talking about that has inspired me so deeply. Where Are We Now, which is a collection of essays taken from pieces that he's written over time. Downtown LA, Inside and Out, which is a, a piece of photojournalism. Close to Home, an American album. California, uh, I'm sorry, California Romantica and House, the, these latter two works he collaborated with Diane Keaton on. He's done, he's written, he's been included in dozens of anthologies about California and Southern California. He's, you, you could possibly have seen his, edit he's written editorials, letters to the editor, and articles for the Los Angeles Time. He's written articles in Los Angeles Magazine. He currently blogs for KCET. He, his, his book, Holy Land, may soon be a somewhat major motion picture in the form of what Don referred to as a non-fiction film, not quite a documentary, not quite a, a, nar a, a, r a narrative representation of, the, of, of reality. Um, and this collection of works doesn't even begin to speak for Don, so I think I'm gonna let him speak for himself. We're very, very, very honored. I am very, very honored to have DJ Waldy address our graduating class. Well, thank you all, and obviously my thanks to Donald Strauss, who is the founding chair of the Urban Sustainability Master of Arts program, and of course to the program's faculty and students. And my thanks also uh, to the university president, Dr. Boggs, for this invitation to join you in this joyous convocation. It is fitting that we gather here in the light and air of Los Angeles and on its good earth to commence another starting point in your lives and to celebrate what all of us have achieved. Your studies advance each of you into the company of men and women here and throughout the world who have made sustainability both an ethic for living and the work they intend to do. Hearts and hands joined in work and in belief beginning here in Los Angeles. Los Angeles is famously a city of new beginnings, a city of second chances and third chances and fourth chances and sometimes even more than that. Generations of Angelinos have been fortunate that this place has been so accepting of us and our many beginnings. Now the materials of our place at its own beginning in 1781 seemed so meager. Just earth, air, sunlight, and too little water. But from these simple gifts was assembled a landscape for our lives that has satisfied so many of our desires. Embedded in that landscape is the paradox of nature here. Well, a cynic might object, there is no nature in Los Angeles. After all, our hills are covered with tracked houses, our rivers are concrete channels, the air overhead is a petrochemical byproduct, and pavement marches to the horizon in every direction. 
And yet all of this, and we too, are embedded in nature, made out of nature, an intimate nature in which, I believe, we discover what sustains us. Nearly every day, I walk to my volunteer job over the dead level streets of suburban Lakewood. There are only a few pedestrians, but I'm always accompanied. My suburban street is a concrete and asphalt fraction of the uniform grid of Los Angeles, but nature is never absent there. Morning doves, mockingbirds, scrub jays, and house sparrows have accompanied my walk as long as I can remember, either in person or as a fugue of bird calls. Song that erupts, repeats overhead, and follows me down my block. Further down my block, a woodpecker has worked at the bark of a backyard elm for several days this spring. I'd never heard that before. Parakeets flock over my street. They're new immigrants to my neighborhood. I've seen hawks perched on the branches of the street trees the developers of my suburb planted 60 years ago. I'm sure the developers didn't expect the hawks. And in recent days, my walk has been punctuated by the warning cries of juvenile crows. Ugly sounding cries and very ordinary. The young crows are giving advice to other crows that I'm passing through their nature, just as the crows are passing through my nature. My block of tract houses is utterly commonplace, but it's also a common ground for the crows and for me, where nature at every scale shapes both my behavior and the crows. For me, the nature that touches my life doesn't reside out there in big charismatic chunks of wilderness. In my neighborhood, and in this tragic and lovely city of Los Angeles, nature is in the shared spaces between us, in the places between you and me, and between us and the crows, places where habits of life are shaped by all the patterns in the landscape. I believe this is nature's city, just as it's yours and mine and the crows. Too many of us mistaken believe that, mistakenly believe that we live in a region without any traces of memory, in a city de devoid of us and our ordinariness, in a place empty of nature's intimacy. There once was a perfect Eden, the conventional story of Los Angeles goes, to which gullible people were lured and then this Edenic Los Angeles declined through a moment of triumphant urbanism into the horrors of suburbanization. And the moral of this story is people ruin places. Well, I believe that people and places form each other, the touch of one returning the touch of the other, and that places, and, and that places acquire their sacredness through this giving and taking. And with that ever-returning touch, we acquire something equally sacred. What we acquire, of course, is a home. And of course, I mean something more than shelter. In fact, we want to be at home in nature and in our relations with one another and in our understanding of the past, but we don't know how. In the novels and essays of Joan Didion is a fascination with something she called the unspeakable peril of the everyday. The coyote in the, by the backyard pool, the rattlesnake in the baby's playpen, the Santa Ana wind pulling at the patio door. Given the weight of our anxieties about the perils of the everyday, given the burden of our regrets about our past, the question I strive to answer is, how do we make a home here? This is a question for all the figures in the landscape, Anglo, African-American, Latino, Asian, and indigenous peoples, all of us in our containers of class and our limited imaginations. When I walk out of the front door of my, my home, I step into a familiar pattern of streets, parks, places of worship, schools, and, st and stores. I see the human scale, 
porous and specific landscape into which was poured the ordinariness that has shaped my work, my convictions, and my aspirations. I enter a nature that breaks through my self-absorption. I cross a grid not just of concrete and asphalt, but of stories, too. I renew my sense of place. My sense of place begins in the belief that each of us has an inner imaginative landscape composed of memory and longing that seeks to be connected to an outer landscape that includes the crows and the hawks, all of nature, as well as my neighbors and all that we've made together. I believe that possessing a sense of place is like a sense of self, part of the equipment of a conscious mind. And I believe that home, whatever home is to you, is where such a sense of place abides. Some Angelinos are finding their sense of place in the most unlikely places. Downtown, for one, where the inhuman city of courts described by historian Mike Davis is acquiring a human, if somewhat gentrified, face. Or consider the places of memory that the Trust for Public Land has created in Maywood, Bell, and Paramount. Their industrial drown brownfields have been made, remade as parks or the refigured space that rail transit is making. There are now 90 miles of commuter rail in LA County, already enough to provide opportunities for transit-oriented development and affordable housing, housing which will become someone's home. Or consider the many forms of environmental justice at work, challenging the institutions of dominance with what is local, specific, communal, sensible, and even humble. The LA River is another place where a sense of place is being remade. The river is where the city's story almost comes full circle, from wilderness to industrial wasteland, to its restoration to us and to this city's nature. The slow greening of the LA River is a sobering demonstration of the limits of environmental action, but it's also a powerful demonstration of a fragmented city pulling itself together. We think of civic life here in Los Angeles, and we yearn for accountability, respect, and decency. We think of our own history, and we desire remembrance, not erasure and amnesia. We think of our neighborhoods, and we want burdens shared, not callous indifference. Instead of betrayal and cynicism, we yearn for a healthy ecology of hope. There are no perfect solutions to these desires, only approximations in the form of a more sustainable city. A sustainable city for me is one that meets human needs and the needs of the environment in ways that are just, economically efficient, grounded in our history, based on the best available science, without compromising either the welfare or the dreams of future generations. Well, we all know we do not have the city we yearn for, that work is unfinished and left for you and you to begin. We have incomparable beaches and mountains, but they're separated from urban neighborhoods by a transit system that is still inadequate. Fresh and healthy food is not in the hands of those who are hungry. The air is cleaner, but not clean enough. The city of Los Angeles imports water at significant environmental cost and flushes treated wastewater out to sea, along with nearly all the runoff of winter rains. Justice to the environment and to our communities seems so clear that we could grasp it, yet justice is too often beyond our reach. But these contradictions can be made right. If we're to make a sustainable Los Angeles within our lifetimes, all of us will have to connect the nature we've got with the home we've made. It will take the initiative of city councils to create more parks with the goal of putting recreational open space no more than half a mile from every home. It will require showing skeptical NIMBYs that higher density infill housing merits their support. It will require greater flexibility from community stakeholders and better land use coordination. It will require the work of your hearts and your hands. I believe that we will find the answers among you and among us and among citizen planners, citizen foresters, and even citizen historians who are willing to be implicated in this city's nature. The result could be a sustainable city, 
a politically progressive city, in a jobs and business oriented city. The author and environmentalist Barry Lopez considered some years ago what might be needed to make a home here. Lopez asked, how can we become vulnerable to the place where we are? Well, hunger for memory is one way to become vulnerable. Take delight in your city stories. Find yourself in its history. Nurture that bit of utopian aspiration from which all things of worth always come. And of course, be brave. Built out, maximally diverse, more urban and more grown up, while Sanchez requires courage to grasp its whole tragic, sacred, human, and humanizing body. We can choose to be vulnerable. We can choose to be, to acquire a sense of place. We can make a home in our ruined paradise. But how? Well, it really is a matter of falling in love. As simple as that. It may surprise you to learn that Lopez's meditation on vulnerability wasn't prompted by some threatened piece of California wilderness. The object of his regard was the place where he grew up, a tract house neighborhood in the San Fernando, San Fernando Valley. And Lopez had this amazing insight while contemplating the valley. He wrote, always when I return, I have found again the ground that propels me past the great temptation of our time to put one's faith in despair. What impels me forward is loyalty to my home, to its raucous crows and its flawed and wonderful people of whom I do not despair. What I've been speaking of is the acquisition of something more than my own idiosyncratic sensibility, but a communal achievement that requires something from all of us. I have to call it the making of a moral imagination, an imagination by which we write ourselves into the story of this place, embrace it as a home, and negotiate away from the purely personal to the public. Today, Los Angeles is beginning again, sustained by the moral imaginations of many new actors in our landscape and proving that there is an ecology of hope here. By your academic efforts and with your dreams, you are uniquely suited to cultivate all the possibilities of hope. You know the history of our environmental struggles. You see how neighborhood interests connect to the larger community. Your coursework and experience have shown you that you cannot separate the idea of any city from the idea of nature. And now, at, the, at this moment of your new beginning in this city of second and third chances, how will you serve its ecology of hope? How will we serve its ecology of hope? Here's how, here's how I think we can begin. Hunger for a home. Long for a sense of place. Cling to the familiar things you touch and which reciprocate with their returning touch. Become implicated in the city's history. And finally, fall in love with where you are. Thank you. Mm, the city of Lakewood was lucky to have this man doling out information for 32 years, I will tell you that. And they're lucky that he's still volunteering to do it now. So, the next part of our commencement ceremony, uh, you'll be introduced not only to our graduates, but you'll be introduced to them by their mentors. In our program, we take mentoring very seriously, and I, the, we agreed that, that this was totally appropriate because who knows these students better than the ones who, those who have worked most closely with them. So, in this order, Gilda Haas, then Jane Paul, then Sue Gentile will 
come up here and I will assist you in handing out diplomas to your mentors before we confer upon them their degrees. I am uh, Daryl Belangius. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and Mia Mayweather's mentor. And I, um, I just wanted to um, tell you for one second what it means to be a mentor at Antioch. It's not, um, my mentees don't um, sit at my feet to get wisdom. If there's any wisdom to be got, it's something we, we build together. Um, and I, I think the, the spirit of it is um, really was nailed by this 14th century mystic named Meister Eckhart who said, the eye through which I see God is the same eye through which God sees me. It's, it's an entirely reciprocal thinking and doing and a wonderful thing. So um, 